I don't know how safe the candy is, but I have lured them into thinking that I don't like candy. So they believe I don't like candy, that's fine. They can put it all in my office. Bobby knows how to get in there. We'll share. <laughs> Isn't that what ho- uh, the, the, when you go trick-or-treating and all that about? If you're a parent like we are, you know, we let our kids go get some candy, and while they're in bed, we pick out a few things we like. And a lot of times we'll tell them, well, that's not good for you. You don't need all of that, so we'll help you. We do a lot of things to train our children, don't we? We train them, uh, boys, we train them how to, to fight or to wrestle and to be men and to work, and we plan for their future, and we tell them what kind of ladies they need to, to find, and girls, we teach them what kind of boys they need to find, and, and how to cook and to, to do things and be a lady and teach them how to be pretty, right? We train our children in all kinds of ways. We train our children how we ought to worship. We tell them what we're doing on Sunday morning to the point where hopefully they all know, and yours, yours know like mine know, that, that it's Sunday. It's not a question of are we going. It's we're going to worship. It's Sunday morning. And then we train them that, you know, you've got to get good grades. Work on your schoolwork before you play. Because when you get older, it's going to matter. We want you to be something. We want you to do something. We want you to use what God has given you. So we train them in that way. There's a song, a country music song, that talks about how we train our children in another way. And I I think I've used this illustration in class, but it's just a good one. There's a country music song that talks about a father and his child going down the road and he says when they, they got to a, they, they'd gone to McDonald's or somewhere and he, he had a fries and nuggets and a little orange drink in his hands and well somebody suddenly stopped in front of them and the lyrics go like this. So he had to slam on his brakes. He said, then my four-year-old said a four-letter word. His dad asked him where he'd heard such a thing, where these lyrics had come from. And he says this, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your little buckaroo. I want to be like you. Grow up tall and be as strong as you are. Because I've been watching you. I can tell my children everything they need to know. I can tell them to get good grades. I can tell them the type of person they ought to date and court and marry. And I can tell them how they ought to be faithful and worship and and serve God with all their life and all their heart, their mind and their soul. But I have to show it to them to really teach them. I have to show it to them to really teach them. Some things we need to teach our children. You know, there was a little girl that uh, I once knew that she, she wasn't using a lot of words yet, and she was in foster care, and she'd had some problems, and, and her parents had, had problems, and she just had a rough little life, and she couldn't really say any of the the words, when she got mad, she didn't know the words yet, but she'd just say, cuss, 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 cuss. And I, it, it was cute and adorable, but it was also, oh, you know, it, it hurt your soul a little bit to hear a little child talk like that and speak like that. Because you know what she wanted to say, she just didn't know what she wanted to say. The truth is, we need to teach our children the right four-letter words. The right four-letter words. Not long ago, there was in Indianapolis two sixth graders that were expressing love inside of a classroom while the teacher was away. They thought they loved each other. And they thought that was a physical thing. That's not... That's not a four-letter word they need to understand. They don't need to understand love in that way. They need to understand it in God's way. But there are some four-letter words we need to teach our children. One of them, number one, is work. I've often thought that my dad was a slave driver. He made me wash my mama's car once a week, his truck once a week. I had to mow the yard. My friends would come over and say, Well, Ty, all you do is work. One, one came over one weekend to ask me a Friday night 
It was a last minute thing. Can you come skiing with us? I'd never been skiing in my life. And my dad said, is the yard mown? Are the cars washed? Now I'd like to tell you that he didn't, that, uh, he didn't make me do all that stuff. Well, he did. I still got to go, but I had to do all that stuff before I could go. I had to make sure my chores were done. And I remember I couldn't get up on the skis anyway. <laughs> didn't know what I was doing. And he let me slide. I, but I, I do remember doing a lot of those things. But you know what? I don't remember despising doing them. In fact, I felt a sense of responsibility in doing them that I was doing something. I was providing. I was taking care of what I needed to do. Now, like any teenage boy, I didn't do everything I should. But I did a lot of things around the house, a lot of things out in the yard, the man stuff, because Dad was traveling a lot. I got a great sense of accomplishment out of doing those things. Didn't know it at the time, but I really did. We need to teach our children how to work and, and how to do something right. It's called the worker's edge. You know, even Adam had to work in the garden. It was good for the soul. And, and worker's edge is... is recognized in the sense of accomplishment. I do something and I see it and it's accomplished and I, I've done something with my time. I've been productive. When God made things and He got done with something, He called it good. Genesis 1 and verse 4, And God saw the light that it was good and God divided the light from the darkness. Genesis 1 and verse 10, And God called the, day land, or, or, called the dry land earth and the gathering together of the waters He called seas. And God saw that it was good. Genesis 1 and verse 31, And God saw everything that He had made, and He beheld, or he beheld it, <clears throat> and it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. I want to do some good things with my work. I want to work, and so when I get done, I can see, and I know it's, it's good. It's good. I want to see what I've accomplished and know it's right. God saw things that were done and he said, it is good. There's something to be said about a good, hard day's worth of work. I don't care if I'm in the office, studying for a lesson, preparing for a class. When I get it all done and get that sermon written or I get that paper done or whatever it is, I feel good about it. Not always about the, the material, but I always feel good about accomplishing the task. I used to get that feeling when I would cut trees down. I would come up and there would be this big oak tree and it looks impossible. And yet I'd take these tools and take that tree down. It always felt good. It's in our design. It's in how we're created. Genesis 2 and verse 15 says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it, and to keep it. Physical work, science has proven, physical work or working out changes our mood. It helps us. It helps us. Work is intimately part of or, or part of who we are. It often defines who we are. You know, as the preacher, uh, you know, you find that people talk about, well, he's the preacher, or that's the preacher, or that's the, the you know, if, if someone else is a police officer, well, that's, he's a police officer. It defines you. Or he's a farmer. It defines who you are. And people use that to define who you are sometimes. And, and we've got to understand that our children someday are going to grow up and we can't provide for them. They're going to have to provide for themselves. They've got to be able to define themselves in the workplace. And that's getting harder and harder every year. To stand out in the work that you do. You know, I think I've always thought a Christian ought to just automatically stand out. Every time a Christian goes to do something, they, they ought to do it as unto the Lord. And when they work, it ought to be that they just stand out a little different, at least a little different than those working around them based upon their principles, based upon their faith, they ought to be a, just a little different. We've got to teach our children to be a little different. Psalm 9 and verse 16 says, The Lord is known by the judgment which He executeth. The wicked is snared in the work 
of his own hands. Our children may work that way. They may work in a wicked way. The wicked worketh a deceitful work, Proverbs 11 and verse 18, but to him that soweth righteousness, you know, sowing is working, doing, shall be a sure reward. I've seen some people work harder to get something free than if they'd just done it themselves. You ever seen anybody do that? I want to work that I get the reward, I reap the reward of my hands. I want to give. I want to teach my children the four-letter word give. C.S. Lewis says, I do not believe one can settle how much he ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In the Gospel accounts in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, one out of every six verses deals with money. Of the 29 parables Christ told, 16 deal with a person and his money. It's a lot about giving, isn't it? We need to be a giver and follow suit. You know, the desperately guarded secret to living a fulfilling life is to be a giving person. Children only want to please. They are in pursuit of pleasing you. They don't even realize it themselves, but they want that accepted uh, in, in understanding that you're pleased with them. Every young man looks to his father and wants to hear, I'm, I'm proud of you, son. I'm proud of you. Be a giver. Emerson said, one of the most wonderful consolations of life is that we can never help others without helping ourselves in the process. Teach them that God is a giver. Matthew 5, verse 42 says, Give to him that asketh thee from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Romans 12, verse 24, or 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt keep whole, or heap coals of fire upon his head. And we know, according as we've been prospered or blessed, we ought to give. What about love? We need to teach them the four-letter word, love. John 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that, whoso, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The world is teaching an entirely different way of what love really is. I can teach my children to memorize John 3 and verse 16. I can teach them how they ought to, to know that verse and know other verses about love. But you know what the world teaches? I, I, I looked at something one time by, in, a, in a magazine called Spokesman's Review or a, a, an article about Spokesman's Review. And Did you know that toy makers... Now, this hit me hard. But do you know that toy makers stay up with, keep up with the divorce rate? Why would they do that? How many parents are teaching love through giving of gifts? How many parents are competing in giving gifts because they don't, because they're afraid and they're teaching love in the wrong, or defining it the wrong way. Love is not about getting stuff, it's about giving stuff. Giving your heart, your time, and being there for them. Advertising is very, it's almost sinister sometimes, isn't it? They look into those dark places and they find our deepest needs, and they, they prey upon those things sometimes. Now, not all advertising's bad. Matthew 19, verse 19 says, Honor thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I want my children to understand love is not a material thing. I give you something, so I must love you. Love is that time and that compassion that they feel from the heart. Children... They know sincerity. You know, you can mess up. I found this out as a father. I can mess up a thousand times, but, but if I'm sincere and I love them and they know I love them, 
They usually forgive me. They really do. Children want sincerity. They don't want gifts. They may be screaming right now. I'm surprised they didn't have an uproar. We want gifts. We don't want... <laughs> they really do, though. They want your love and your time. Got another thing to say about that, really. One of the best gifts you can give your children, mamas and daddies, is to love one another. I don't mean your children. I'm talking about mama loving daddy and daddy loving mama. In that way that is the agape sacrificial love. That love that goes in beyond even the child-parent relationship. Did you know it's in that order? So often that gets askewed. When children come into the picture, sometimes that relationship, that mom and daddy relationship, gets separated and gets kind of pushed to the side a little bit. Well, we'll, 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 we'll work on me and you after we get these children raised. It's not what our children need. It's not what we need. We've got to work on that relationship between mama and daddy. Our children need to see mommy and daddy loving, being affectionate to some degree, being kind to one another, being a team. Our spouse has to come before our children. That's hard sometimes, isn't it? They're grown. They can take care of themselves. Well, they can, but they need their help meet. They need their spiritual leader in the home. What about teaching our children obedience, to obey? You know, it wasn't long ago that they tried to outlaw spanking in California. It was a bill that came up. That, and I, I remember reading about it in... And people were, they were trying to set up a, a law that you could not give your child corporal punishment. You couldn't spank them. Your own child. It's amazing where this world has gone sometimes. There should never be the question why come out of the voice or out of the mouth of a child unless they're wondering like one little girl, her daddy was talking to her and teaching her about something. And he said, you know, God can see everything we do. And she was laying on her bed. And she looked up at the ceiling and she said, well, how does he see through the roof? Why, why, do, why does he have to look through that? Well, that's okay, why? Or, why does it rain? That's okay. But when daddy says, take out the garbage, and you go, why? That's not acceptable, is it? We've got to teach our children ob obedience and how to obey because God says one day to them, obey the gospel, be faithful, give, worship, live faithfully unto death, do it. We don't want them going, why? Right? We don't want them going, why should I do that? We don't want them going, well, what about me? Right? We want them to be obedient to God. One writer said, the first duty of every soul is not to find its freedom, but its master. I remember reading about Roger Staubach, who led the Dallas Cowboys to victory in 1971. He, he admitted that his position as a quarterback, uh, who, who didn't call his own signals, his own plays, was a source of trial for him. Coach Landry spent every, or sent every play to him, told him every play, pretty much almost every play he had to do. When Roger had to pass or when Roger needed to run the ball, and only in emergency situations could he change the play. And he said, and I had better been right. Even though Roger considered uh, Coach Landry to have a genius mind, when it came to football strategy, pride said that he should have been able to call more of his own plays. Rager, or later, Roger said, I faced up to the issue of obedience. Once I learned to obey, there was harmony, fulfillment, and victory. Psalm 111 and verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. When I fall into 
the, the mind of God and His obedience, and I fall in line with what He wants, then I'm, I'm looking for victory. I'm assured of victory. And I'm assured that harmony will get me there and fulfillment will get me there. What about time? Where did it go? I saw a post this week on Facebook watching little children grow and how, how tall they get, how quickly they grow. You ought to see the pants, how often we have to buy new pants for Dale because he's the first and poor, poor Monroe, he gets whatever Dale didn't tear up. And so as we're going through this, I'm like, Man, I just bought jeans. You just asked for money for jeans, you know, last month, two months ago. I'm going to put a brick on his head. It doesn't work, is that what somebody said? <laughs> but they grow fast. Time gets away from us. They need us to make sure we spend the time as we ought to. One very prominent man, very busy man, took his son fishing, and the son later on <clears throat> looked at his diary, and he opened his diary about going fishing. He bothered his dad about going fishing. Oh, I'd like to go fishing with dad. Oh, I want to go fishing with dad. They didn't catch a single fish. But when they got home, he wrote in his diary, he said, the great, the, I went fishing with my dad, greatest day of my life. Sadly, the man kept a diary as well, and in his journal, went fishing today. Biggest waste of time. Didn't get anything done. Not even, didn't even catch a fish. We have to take our children fishing. We have to take time to spend with them to teach them the truth. I think it applies, we can apply Ephesians 5 verse 16, redeeming the time for the day or for the days are evil or because the days are evil. The death rate is always the same everywhere, one for one. Hebrews 9 and verse 27 tells us that. And you know, I've got to take time right now because time is, is not really on my side. Time is leading towards them getting out on their own, them going out and being their own, their own man, their own woman. And I've got to get them ready for that. Proverbs 22 and verse 6 tells me that, you know, one day they're going to be old. I'm reminded in that verse of Scripture that one day they're going to be out on their own. And whatever I've trained them, I can tell them and tell them and tell them. But really, whatever I've done in front of them is what's going to help them return back to that which is right. The old path, the right way. So when they get old, I've trained them and they won't depart from it. They'll know the way they should go by what I've done and the way I've gone. Teach your children some four-letter words. Teach them the meaning of God and in their life and how they ought to live. Teach them the meaning of work and to give and to love and, and what time really is. And teach them the gospel because you're living it out in front of them. This morning, maybe you're here and you've never obeyed the gospel. This is your opportunity. It's a simple work. It's not, a, it's not an earning of salvation. It's not a, anything but going up and, and it's an act of obedience. We go up, you're baptized for the remission of sins. The Lord adds you to the church. And then He calls on you to live faithfully all the days of your life. And the great thing is He helps you every step of the way. Like a good father helping a child, He, he helps you every single step of the way. This morning, maybe you have obeyed the gospel at some point in your life and you find that you haven't been giving or working or spending time or loving as you ought to. And this morning, you've been convicted by the Word of God to, to make those things right, to make that change. This morning, if you have a need, let me encourage you to come as we stand and as we sing.